So our call to worship comes from Psalms 103, uh, verses 8 to 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I just got reminded of that verse this week. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. So let's stand as we pray and get ready, get our hearts ready for worship. God, we thank you. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you stepped in while we were still sinners, that you died for us, Jesus. That you removed our, the consequences of our sin from us. And that as far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed those transgressions from us. So God, we just, we open our hearts and we open our minds and our, and our hands to you today and we ask that you would just come and speak to us, Lord. We long for your presence. We long for a fresh touch from you. And we thank you that you are not some cold, distant God, but that you want to be intimately infused in your creation all the time. And so, yeah, we just open ourselves up to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean, singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall it
peace and endless sea so full of grace and mercy we sing God is so with gratitude this morning and that you would open our eyes to all of the things that you have blessed us with. You are a good father. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's no greater love than that. Thank you, Jesus.
every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, 
please be seated for prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all praise belongs to you. You are our rock, our shield, our cornerstone. And this morning, we lift high your beautiful name, and we praise you with thankful hearts. Whatever our circumstances, Lord, we, de we declare that you are Lord of our lives, and we choose to fix our eyes on Jesus, who holds all things together, and in whom we live and move and have our being. We praise you, Eternal One, Emmanuel, God with us. Continue to root and establish us in your love. And may we not be shy to declare our love for you. And while we praise you, Lord, we also acknowledge that we've sinned this week. We may have said an unkind word or been selfish or given into a, a sin pattern. And so, Holy Spirit, we just pause now. I ask that you would specifically show each one of us the way that we have grieved you and help us to genuinely confess to you. Jesus, risen King, we are made clean because of your work on the cross. Beautiful Savior, how wonderful is your love for us. So instead of guilt and shame, we respond to your love. We receive your grace and mercy. We joyfully repent. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just renew in us a desire to live in freedom, the freedom that you offer, and move us out of any complacency we may have in our relationship with you. I ask that today afresh that you would birth in us a desire to know you more deeply so that we can live faithfully, fruitfully, overflowing with love to others. And as we think of others, Lord, Jesus, our hearts are breaking for those in our province who have been affected by the flooding. And we bring you our concern and our sadness. We pray, Lord, that the floodwaters will recede and the river levels would drop. We pray that the forecast for this week uh, will not be as much rain as has been anticipated. And we pray for each person who's been um, affected by the evacuation and has lost their um, property or their livelihood, their animals. Pray, God, that you would um, draw near and bring your peace and comfort to those who are desperate. Comfort especially for the families of the people who lost their lives in the sl slides. I also pray for our brothers and sisters in the churches in these towns, Lord. Would you bless them as they care and love for one another and for others? And I just thank you, too, for the volunteers and the armed forces, for all those that are working to repair, and for the stories of strangers that have been taking people in. Lord, Father, I just ask that you would blanket these communities in this devastation with your love, and that your light might shine hopefully and bring... Um, Sorry, bring hope and uh, shine brightly. Would you do this, Father? Would you blanket those communities? And we know that there's so many in our community that are in need of your hope and your light and your comfort as well, Lord. And you've really put on my heart today, um, people have been waiting such a long time for surgeries that finally have surgery dates. Pray against any changes to that. Pray for people who have had unexpected um, circumstances rock their world. Lord, would you be in that, those situations? Pray for everyone struggling with anxiety and stress. For families who um, have challenges of mental health. And I also pray especially for marriages that are hurting and relationships that are broken. In all these ways and many more, Lord, we need you. And I just um, thank you that you know each and every need of all of us, of all your children. May we have eyes and ears to see you walking with us. And Jesus, may you be a tangible presence of peace to us, that we may love and care and support for one another well. Would you give us courage to bring our needs out into the open so that as a church family we can love and care and be your hands and feet, Jesus. 
pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. I did just want to also let you know that our district office uh, has an emergency fund in, that they can use to help people that have been affected by the floods. So if you would like to donate to that, you can go do so by going on to our church website and donating and just marking it um, flood victims so that we can then um, get that, those donations um, out to places that need, have the great need. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention as well. And then this morning, we, do, we are just going to um, commission the, um, the boxes for Samaritan's Purse. And I just want to thank everybody in the congregation. I just get my papers here so I get the right information. Um, we have on the North Shore collected 900 boxes. And those will be sent out. So thank you to everyone. Isn't that good? Yeah, give it up. So today is the last day to drop off your boxes, but you can continue to pack a box by going to um, online to packabox.ca. And the boxes that our community, the North Shore um, in Canada, usually um, get sent to the countries are um, either in Central America or East Africa. And so that's just amazing. And so we want to, um, I'm going to hold one of these boxes right now just as a symbol and a token of the 900, over 900 that have been packed. And so join me in just praying for these boxes as they get sent out. Lord, we pray that these shoe boxes will be an effective ministry tool to open doors for the gospel to be presented and for Jesus to be made known. We pray, God, that you will put each shoebox gift in the hands of just the right child so that every boy and girl can experience your love in a special way. And we pray that many children will join the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program, and we hold up all the teachers and pastors who are already preparing for teaching these classes. And Lord, we pray that these boxes from BC that need to get to Calgary for processing will not be unduly delayed. We hold up all the logistical challenges caused by the flood, and uh, we ask you to make a way. And we just want to thank you and ask you to bless all the volunteers involved in um, Operation Christmas Child here at our church. We thank you for the preteens that um, put the boxes together for Michelle and Brenda and their team, again, spearheading this ministry for all the volunteers across Canada and the world. We just want to um, know that you would be glorified in this ministry, Lord. We praise you and thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just want to... Um, Dismiss the preteens now. Michelle is upstairs and um, waiting for you out there. And um, we'll just have Paul come to give us the message now. Good morning, church. Am I on? Yeah. It's such a joy to share with you what God has laid on my heart through this passage uh, this week. And uh, as I get started, I would like to invite you to think back to the beginning of this year and recall some of the resolutions that you've made. Or if you didn't make any, think about something new that you have started. It could be a new project, a plan, a relationship, or a new season of life. Now it is likely that with your resolution or the new thing that you have started was accompanied with some kind of hope or goal in mind. A classic New Year's resolution is to make it a regular habit to work out. And the hope or goal that accompanies this resolution is to have a healthier lifestyle. And every year you will see gyms teeming with people in January. Or maybe you are a student, and at the start of the new semester, you were determined to do well, and your hope uh, was to make better marks than you did the year before. And at the beginning of the semester, you feel motivated, organized, and on top of your assignments and extracurricular activities. Or perhaps you are entering into a season of retirement, and the hope and goal is to experience rest. And at the start of this new season, there is much anticipation and excitement for what lies ahead. Now, the goal should profoundly shape how the resolution or the new thing or the new season is pursued. But alongside the goal, there needs to be something or someone that comes alongside you to keep you on track so that you can persevere 
even when there is a lack of motivation or adversity, difficulties, and hardships come your way. And we see that without support systems in place, gym attendance exponentially plummets as the year goes by. Students struggle to finish well towards the end of the semester as anxiety and stress build up, or retirees become increasingly restless throughout their retirement instead of rested. In all that we pursue, whether it is a short or long-term uh, something, it is important to know uh, what the goal and purpose is, as well as to have support systems in place to be successful in those ventures and seasons. Now, if this is true about the everyday things of life, what about your faith? If I were to ask you, what is the purpose, the goal, the hope for being a Christ follower, what would you say? Is the goal to avoid eternal judgment? Is the goal to be a better person? Is it part of your pursuit to a happier, healthier, wealthier life? Or perhaps you haven't given much thought about the goal or purpose of being a Christ follower, and you are happy simply to live life coasting along with a little encouragement from the faith. So what is the goal of following Christ according to the scriptures? It is simple yet all-encompassing. It is to center your life around Jesus in all things so that it results in glory and praise to God. To put it another way, it is a life of worship to God. All of creation and life was made to worship. But if that is the goal, how do we get there? One of my favorite sermon titles that Pastor Mark penned while he was here was Made to Worship but prone to wander. And that pretty much summarizes my heart. I long to worship, but my heart is so prone to wander. How can we cultivate a life that is in alignment with that desire to center our lives around Jesus? And what would that look like? We can begin with prayer. So this morning, we'll be continuing our sermon series on prayer and the people of God, and our text, Philippians 1, 9 through 11, will teach us three petitions that will begin to shape our prayers so that we could live out faithful and fruitful lives to the praise and glory of God. But before we begin, let me begin with a word of prayer. Father God, you are rich in mercy and abundant in power. So I ask you to do what only you can do this morning, which is to open up ears to hear your voice, to open up hearts to receive your word, and to bring about renewal, transformation, joy, and hope uh, to spring up in our hearts this morning as we look to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we go into our passage, it's always helpful to get some context to understand Paul's audience and their life circumstance when the letter was written. So the church in Philippi was the first church Paul started in Eastern Europe. That story is told in Acts 16. And Philippi was a city with strong ties to Rome. Paul and his ministry partner Silas faced strong opposition when preaching Jesus was the true king of the world. And we see that even in Paul's suffering, opposition, and imprisonment, we see God on the move, opening prison doors and the most unlikely people getting saved in that city. After Paul moved on from Philippi, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer persecution, but they remained a faithful community committed to Jesus. While Paul was in prison, once again, the church in Philippi had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to support him. And so Paul sends this letter back with Epaphroditus to say thank you for their partnership, but also to encourage the church to continue to participate in the way of Jesus. The centerpiece of the letter is in chapter 2, 
where Paul retells the story of Jesus, the servant, savior, king, from his incarnation to his exaltation. And the surrounding pieces of the letter points the community to see their own lives and story in light of Jesus' story of redemption. Which brings us to the first prayer in the letter, which reorients our lives to participate in the redemption story of Jesus. How can we pray in a way that helps shape our lives to be faithful and fruitful to the praise and glory of God? Number one, pray that we may abound in love. Pray that we may abound in love. So I invite you to open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. You can follow along on the screen behind me. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. A few verses earlier in verse 6, we see that Paul is confident that God, who began the good work of redemption in the church in Philippi, will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And so this prayer fleshes out how the good work of redemption would look throughout their lives. And the first petition is that God would cause their love to abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And it's important to note here that the the your here is plural in Greek. And as we heard last week in Marty's sermon, Marty's grandma favored the term use guys to indicate the plural. But as I've spent some time in Texas, in Texas the vernacular is y'all to indicate the plural. And I I realize that there are actually two different designations. Y'all refers to a small group and all y'all refers to a much larger group. So this verse is saying, that your prayer, may, that all y'all's love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And what is interesting about this request is that the object of love is not defined here. Paul intentionally does this to show that the love that is to abound within them is to be comprehensive in scope. Love for God and love for others. And this love is to be, and this love abounding more and more is a picture of abundance, overflowing, growing, expanding, permeating, saturating. And this love is not blind or uninformed or simply to do with the emotions. The love that is to abound grows alongside knowledge and depth of insight or discernment. One commentator writes, Insight without knowledge is meaningless. Knowledge without love is nothing. Love without knowledge is without substance. Knowledge and love are not merely compatible. They are mutually necessary. In any relationship, genuine growth in love must be accompanied by growth in knowledge and insight. Think about a good friend that you have or your significant other. Do you like to spend time with them? What is their character like? What are they passionate about? What upsets them? What encourages them or builds them up? What makes them happy? Now, if I were to say, yes, I really love my wife, Gina, but I don't particularly like to spend time with her, and I can't really tell you what she's like. I love her, but I have a whole host of other things that need to take priority. I have heard from her friends what she's into and what she's passionate about, but I can't be certain. Now, if I were to tell you this, you would probably recommend that I immediately go to marriage counseling and figure some stuff out. And this type of response would be a love without knowledge. And this would be a relationship that cannot flourish. And this is true of how we love God and how we love others. How can we love God when we don't spend time with him and find out what he's like and what he feels deeply about? How can we say we love others when we are blind to their needs and concerns and longings? To have knowledge and depth of insight is not merely to store up information and increase the girth of our heads. It is to know and truly see God as he has revealed himself 
and to see others in light of the story of God. One commentator writes, what we need is truth-saturated love and love-saturated truth. Perhaps one way that you can practice this petition in the coming week is to simply pray, God, I long to know you more. I long to know you more. And alongside that prayer, begin reading through one of the gospel accounts throughout the week. And pay attention to the person of Jesus and what he's like. What is Jesus passionate about? What upsets him? What does Jesus invite his followers into? For when you see Jesus, you are looking at the face of God. Another way that you can practice this petition is to reach out to a friend this week and let them know that you are thinking of them and see if they have any prayer requests. And as soon as you hear back from them, take a moment to pause and pray for them. The first step in living a faithful and fruitful life that brings glory and praise to God is when our hearts are abounding in love for God and love for one another. So how can we pray in a way that helps shape our lives to be faithful and fruitful to the praise and glory of God? First, we pray that we may abound in love. Second, we pray that we may approve what is best. We pray that we may approve what is best. So I'll start reading from verse 9 again to give us the full context of this verse. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. This verse points to what our abounding love of God and others leads to. It leads to the ability to discern what is best. The verb translated discern carries the idea of testing and approving, used in non-theological contexts related to precious metals or money. It was the ability to see what is genuine and what is counterfeit. The verb discern can also refer to the ability to assess and adopt what is truly essential and excellent. Christian love is to equip the believer not simply just to distinguish what is right from wrong, but also discern what is best from what is merely second best. And this ability to approve some, uh, to, to approve is not stockpiling the mind with information or becoming a know-it-all legalist. To approve something involves understanding what God has revealed, delighting in what he has revealed, and doing what he has revealed. In other words, discernment is not merely informative, it is transformative. It is about life renewal. It is to live as God has intended for us to live, in alignment with his will. And throughout the epistles, Paul often connects the will of God in relation to our spiritual formation, to not be conformed to the pattern of this world, growing in sanctification, fleeing from sexual immorality, to give thanks in all circumstances, to not get drunk on wine, but to be filled with the Spirit. All of these statements are connected and said to be the will of God for your life. Our love and truth-saturated lives are to lead to inner renewal with an outward expression of obedience so that we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. To be pure and blameless is not sinless perfection. Rather, the word pure has the idea of being unmixed or distinct. So to be pure before God is to have God as our distinctive or chief desire, unmixed, undivided in our allegiance. And Paul uses this word blameless again in chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. And to be blameless here is related to committing to walk in the path of Christ to shine as his light in the world and to hold fast to his word of life. So what might it look like to discern what is best for our lives 
in a way that leads to renewal and transformation. Consider this parable that Alan Fadling writes in his book, An Unhurried Life. There was once a king who had two servants. One of the servants, for fear of not pleasing his master, rose early each day to hurry along to do all the things that he believed the king wanted done. He didn't want to bother the king with questions about what the work was. Instead, he hurried from project to project from early morning until late at night. The other servant, also eager to please his master, would rise early as well. But he took a few moments to go to the king, ask him about his wishes for the day, and find out just what it was he desired to be done. Only after such a consultation did this servant step into the work of his day, work comprised of tasks and projects the king himself had expressed an interest in and a desire for. The busy servant may have gotten a lot of things done by the time the inquiring servant even started his work, but which of them was doing the will of the master and pleasing him? Genuine productivity is not about getting as much done for God as we can manage. It is doing the good work God actually has for us in a given day. Genuine productivity is learning that we are more than servants, that we are beloved sons and daughters, invited into the good kingdom work of our Heavenly Father. That being the case, how might God be inviting you to wait for his specific direction? Or is God inviting you to take a specific step now? God is calling us to know what he has already revealed concerning his will. But he has also called us to discern not just good things, but the best things to pursue for each particular day. This requires spending some time with him, listening to his voice, and following his lead. It begins with having a heart abounding in love, which leads to renewal and transformation, which in turn empowers us to discern and walk in the way of Christ until he returns. Perhaps one way that you can begin to practice this is to simply ask God every morning, what would you like for me to step in today in regards to my heart and my hands? God, is there anything you want to transform and purify in me today? God, is there anything you would like me to pursue for your kingdom today? And as God speaks, may your heart posture be yes and amen before him. Another action step that you could take, it just so happens that on Tuesday there is a seminar on discerning the voice of God. Perhaps that's an action take, step you could take this week, is to go to that seminar and practice what it means to discern God's voice. So how can we pray in a way that helps shape our lives to be faithful and fruitful to the praise and glory of God. First, pray that we may abound in love. Second, pray that we may approve what is best. And third, pray that we may be abundant in the fruit of right living. Pray that we may be abundant in the fruit of right living. So let's read from verse nine all the way through verse 11. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul's final petition for the church is a picture of abundance. And this fruit of righteousness can simply be understood as the natural outgrowth or outcome of living in the way of Jesus. Abounding love for God and others is the soil in which we plant the seeds of discernment and action, and the result is beautiful fruit that displays the beauty and goodness of God. And God's vision for our lives is not to produce a meager, 
amount of fruit. No, the goal is that our lives would be filled up. A picture of abundance. And that's what Jesus meant when he says that he has come to give us life and life abundantly. It is that our lives would bring in a bountiful harvest of righteousness that displays God's goodness and beauty to the world. But do you notice where the fruit comes from? It doesn't come from ourselves or the labors of our hands. The fruit comes through Jesus Christ. And I'm reminded of what Jesus says in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the one who causes and enables fruit to grow. If you want to be filled up with the abundance of Christ, you need to abide in him. Find your life in him. And the thing about seeing fruit grow is that it brings about joy. And that's the result of abounding love, approving what is best, and being abundant in fruit. As we lay down our will and in turn follow, serve, and obey Christ for all our days, it is not a joyless endeavor. It's actually the pathway to our joy. And what does, this, what does all of this ultimately lead to? It leads to where all of human history is heading towards. It leads to the glory and praise of God. And that's what it's all about. Glory is the display of God's beauty, majesty, and greatness. And praise is our response of adoration, exaltation, and joy. An abundantly fruitful life gives God glory and gives us joy. And so we can be confident to live out our lives knowing that from him, through him, and to him are all things my wife, Gina, has a little balcony garden, and she planted some pepper seeds last season. And like all plants, it required soil, sunlight, and a careful eye on water intake, and of course, great patience. And for a long time, nothing seemed to be happening. Even after countless waterings and waiting, nothing. But one day, many months later, we saw one tiny little flower appear. And then a few more flowers. And then after some more waiting, finally one tiny little pepper emerged from that garden. And while it didn't seem like much, we rejoiced because there was indeed life in those trees. But even after the first appearing, it was still a while longer before the pepper matured and was ready to be picked and eaten. And as time went by, more peppers grew, and our rejoicing continued. This fruitful life that God calls us into is not something that happens overnight. It's something that is cultivated in us for our entire lives. And it's a journey that at times we feel like nothing is happening, or we feel discouraged by the progress that we're making. But the call to the fruitful life is to stay connected to the life of Jesus. It is to receive from him living water, a fresh filling of the spirit each day. It is to receive from him real food, to meditate on his word day and night. It is to soak in his life-giving light to spend time in his presence. And as we stay connected to Jesus in his time and in his season, Jesus will unleash and produce in us beautiful, bountiful fruit that is life transforming and redemptive, that gives God glory and gives you great joy. Perhaps one way that you can put this into practice this week is that every time you eat a piece of fruit or you see some fruit lying around your garden or your house, you can pray to God, would you fill me with your abundance? Would you fill me 
with your abundance? Would you cultivate my heart and connect me to Jesus this day? So friends, how can we pray in a way that helps shape our lives to be faithful and fruitful to the praise and glory of God? We pray that we may abound in love. Pray that your love for God and others would be overflowing and bound up in truth and insight. Pray that we may approve what is best. Pray that God would give you eyes to see what he is forming in you and the good works that he has prepared for you to walk in each day. Pray that we may be abundant in the fruit of right living. Pray that you would draw from and stay connected to the life of Jesus so that his beauty and goodness might be displayed in you even as you are filled with joy. May you know the power and joy of God at work in your life as you abide and walk with Jesus each day. I'll invite the worship team up as we pray together. God of all abundance, abundant in mercy, overflowing with grace, would you tune our hearts and our minds to receive from you the abundant life in Jesus? Would you cause our hearts to abound in love more and more? And would that lead us to approving what is best and to, to discern and to listen what you are calling us to each and every day? And would you produce in us bountiful fruit of righteousness that gives you glory and gives us joy? Transform us. Remind us to stay connected to the life of Jesus, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to stand to respond. Lord.
been a joy to gather with you this morning. Uh, we do have prayer ministry available, so if there's something that God has called out to you during the message or any, any burden that you have on your heart, we would love to come alongside and pray with you. David Kramer and Dan and Andrea Hefner will be up here at the front. Um, they would love to pray with you. We'll conclude with a blessing, which is our text for this morning. So my prayer is that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.